everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today um, for week three of our four-part webinar series. Um, today, Adventures in Retirement, Embracing Some Unconventional Golden Years, right? I think a really exciting topic on just talking about what some people are starting to do today that isn't just retiring and sitting on the couch and withering away, but you know, spending some time having fun and, and traveling and all kinds of fun stuff today. With that, let me hand this over to Mr. Paul Horn to kick us off today. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us on today's webinar. Again, my name is Paul Horn. I'm a senior financial planner here with Benefit Financial Services Group. Uh, like Chad said, I'm actually really excited about today's webinar. Um, just in recent years, I've seen a shift in mentality in the clients that we're helping. Uh, and I think COVID really has been kind of the catalyst for this. We're just seeing more and more clients that are embracing unconventional retirements. You know, people are choosing to live life on their own terms. And, you know, it's that old YOLO, right? You only live once. Um, so we'll be covering a lot of good information here. Presenting with me today is going to be uh, Pat Powers. We're extremely lucky to have him because he is someone that's lived an adventurous lifestyle his entire life. So Pat, can you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hello, everybody. Um, I'm a founding partner of BFS Wealth Management, and I've been in the business for 35 years or thereabouts. Uh, I uh, am a big fan of retiring with a purpose, uh, not thinking about it as retiring, but thinking about it as repurposing. Uh, I thought I'd get in the, into the mood of things by wearing my uh, 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 retirement shirt here and my straw hat and uh, got my map of the world behind me with little uh, orange push pins in every place that I've been. And I'm going to keep trying to fill that up. So just wanted to get in the spirit of things uh, this morning. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just say it. All right. So what do we mean when we say adventurous retirement? Well, that is a broad term. Uh, today, we're going to focus on five things that we're seeing. Uh, the first one is living abroad. Second is relocation, living in an RV, traveling throughout retirement, or having a second home in retirement. Now, these will be in the context of retirement, but maybe you're not retirement age yet, but you are considering these things like relocating. Uh, please stay with us. You should find a lot of good information in today's webinar. So we're going to start with living abroad. Uh, Chad, can you go ahead and kick us off with our first poll? I can. Thank you so much, Paul. So again, for everybody on the line live today, let me launch that poll. It should pop up on your screen. I will share responses at the end. Uh, but since we will have people on a replay, um, let me kind of read off what the question is. It is, where would be your first choice to move abroad or out of the United States? Um, the question, the answers we have on the screen here, although are, they are not all inclusive, are you know Europe, the Middle East, Asia, Central or South America, or I would never leave the United States. I'm going to be, leave this up for just a second as we gather a few more responses in here. And now I will close polling with most people having responded. And let me share results with the group. So uh, of most people responding, you have you know 40% saying they would never leave the United States at the very bottom there. But a good 34% say they would love to get travel or move over to Europe. Nobody moving to the Middle East, but some Asia and Central or South America also here at 14 and 12% respectively. So some pretty, pretty cool polling numbers. Yeah. Yeah. And not a surprise that Europe is the most popular destination. Um, when we look at the 10 most population destinations that retirees are going to, most of them are going to Europe. In fact, four of the top five are in Europe where we're seeing places like Spain, France, Italy, Ireland even Greece making it there. Um, when we look at the other remaining places, we're seeing individuals moving to Mexico, kind of hard to see here because they're small, but Panama, Costa Rica, Ecuador. In fact, when we look at the top 10 places, only one location is not in Europe or South and Central America. And that's actually Thailand and Asia. Now you might be wondering what is the number one most popular destination? Where are retirees truly going to? Well, that number one with a bullet right now is actually Portugal. I've actually helped two different clients in the last uh, three years move to Portugal. Um, why? You might be asking, right? Um, if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. Portugal is part of the European Union. They have a great culture, low cost of living. And for those of us that have been born and raised or live in Southern California, it's the location that has the weather that's closest to what we experience here in SoCal. So what are some things that you need to consider if you're looking to move abroad? Well, number one, just understand what your goals or reasons are for retiring abroad. You know, if you don't have a good reason, it doesn't mean don't go, but, you know, something to kind of consider. Maybe if you're looking to move because you don't like the politics here in the U.S., 
give it four years and it'll change anyways. You know, and I, this is the kind of the captain obvious statement, but choose your location carefully. Um, this is something that is very important. When you are choosing a location, you should be looking at things like, what's the culture like? What is the religions like? What are the politics like? What is the weather like? What is the crime? What is the healthcare systems? Those are the sort of things that you need to factor in when you're trying to make that decision. It's important to understand the visa and residency requirements. You know, if you're looking to move abroad, you're probably going to want to become a citizen there at some point. So you need to understand what's required to make that happen. Understand the cost of living and create a budget. Now, you truly won't know the cost of living in the area until you actually do that, right? But having that budget ahead of time gives you an idea in terms of what it's going to cost and how it should impact your finances. Also, if you're deciding between two areas, having that budget and kind of seeing what the different costs are in those two locations can help you decide where you may want to end up. You need to develop a plan for insurance and Medicare. What happens if you choose to move to Ireland and you end up in the hospital? You want to make sure you have insurance that's paying that bill so you're not on the hook for it. Make sure you utilize resources for social security. You know, have a plan for your home and belongings here in the U.S. You know, how are you going to store your goods? How is that going to be taken care of? If you still own your home and you want to keep your home, who's going to watch it? Sort of things like that. And then understand how your taxes are going to be impacted. Now, this one's a little bit tricky. Uh, the U.S. has agreements with most countries where you're going to pay taxes in just one country. But depending where you end up, there actually is a chance where you may end up paying double taxes, paying taxes in the country you're living and also paying U.S. taxes. So this is something you want to be aware of before you move. Now, it comes without saying to make sure that you test brought, you know, test drive your retirement abroad. So make sure you visit the location. What a lot of people forget to do, though, is visit in different seasons. If you're looking to go to Spain, obviously you're going to be there during, you know, the high tourist times, you know, when everybody wants to be in Spain. But go there in the off seasons. Make sure that it's still the place that you want to live and that you're comfortable with the weather and everything like that. Um, Pat, I know when we talked recently, you had mentioned something about visa changes for Europe. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, um, the uh, there's a change uh, underfoot where U.S. residents are going to re be required to have um, a visa to uh, visit most of the countries in Europe. Uh, it was supposed to be in effect already, but they've delayed it another year, is my understanding. And uh, you'll be okay this year, but uh, starting in 2024, most likely you're going to have to have a visa before you visit a country in Europe. I think it'll be all electronic, and I think it'll be very, very easy to get and relatively inexpensive as well. But uh, it's just going to be an extra step that you're going to have to contend with. News to me. It's good to know. My, uh, Paul, can you go back just one second? Yeah. Um, I just I came a, a, across a real good uh, resource called uh, Bright Tax. Uh, BrightTax.com, I think, is the email address, and they list the top countries to uh, retire in the 14 best places. And they do a really nice job on it because they talk to you about what the cost of living is uh, in the country uh, on a per month basis, what healthcare is like there, how it's ranked, what safety is like, and how it's ranked. Uh, relative to other countries, what the retirement visa requirements are, what the local culture is like, and what the uh, expat uh, community is like, which is people that move from the United States to uh, another country. And um, I'd, I'd recommend it as a pretty good resource to uh, take a look at. Uh, I thought it was uh, uh, very well done and it's up to date. Uh, so we can get that uh, uh, email address to you or, or uh, not the email address to log on to you if uh, anyone's interested in that. That's great to know. Um, we'll provide some additional links to resources. We have a link from um, the U.S. State Department talking about uh, taking care of health care when you're living abroad. Uh, for people that are expats or people living abroad and collecting Social Security, we have something for the Social Security uh, website on that. And we'll also have a link around IRS and paying taxes when you're living abroad as well. So if you want more information on those specific things, uh, we will provide you those links as well. All right. So when you're looking to move abroad, um, as you're going through the making the stages, there's just going to be a lot of different motions that you're going to be looking at, whether it's anxiety, excitement, a little bit fearful, maybe. Um, when you do make the move, there's going to be kind of a four phases, um, four emotional stages, probably a better way to say that, that you're going to go through. This is something I've witnessed with the clients that we've helped move uh, 
<clears throat> sorry about that. So that first period is going to be the honeymoon period. This is typically the first one to two months. Once you make that move abroad, everything's new. Everything's exciting. Really looking forward to it. After the first month or two, reality begins to set in. And a lot of period people go through a period of isolation. You know, you can no longer just pick up the phone, call your buddy and grab coffee with them or grab dinner. It's much harder um, as you're going in this process where you're a new place, new things. You have to have new habits, right? Your old habits that you used to have before you moved, those are all changing. And that's going to lead to the adjustment period. And as you develop these new daily habits, these new routines, you're going to find footing, you're going to find traction, and you're going to go through the adjustment period. I would say from what I've seen, this tends to be the longest of the four, of the four stages. Most people typically take about six to nine months for this. And then after about a year or so, there tends to be the sense of enthusiasm, that final stage where people are kind of accepted, they're happy with it, and they're happy that they made the change. So what are some tips for a friend for a successful transition? First, you want to set realistic expectations. If you have uh, too much pressure on yourself, that can just lead to setting yourself up for frustration or failure. So just give yourself some grace and just understand this is going to take time. Develop a plan to stay in touch with loved ones. A good example of this is an app called WhatsApp, which allows you to do texting and phone calls without having to worry about roaming charges. And this is going to be really, really important. When we look back at those stages and we talked about the stage of isolation, this is going to help get you through that period. In the beginning, every decision is going to be difficult. Just be patient. And there's going to be uh, times where you're going to question your, your, your decision. When you're going through that isolation period and that adjustment period, you're going to be wondering to yourself, did I make the right decision? Why did I do this? Am I crazy? Should I have done this? All those are negative thoughts. You're just going to have to kind of work through them. And it's very common. Everybody kind of goes through that. Now, when you come out on the other end, you're really going to be impressed with yourself and realizing how tough you really are. I had one client several years ago, live in, lived in San Diego. She was in her early 60s. Her husband uh, was diagnosed with late stage cancer. It's one of those things where they went to the doctor, not, a, not knowing what to expect, come out, and he's given three to six months to live. He passed away a few months later, really unfortunate situation. Um, so she was widowed. Her family was no longer in the area. She didn't have any kids, had a few friends, but a lot of them had moved away. Um, her husband had handled the finances up until that point. So she was really going through a lot at one time. Um, she did luckily have connections with some, from, with some family that lived in Ireland. So her dad had grown up in Ireland, moved to the U.S. where... Um, he lived. And then she decided to go back to Ireland and visit her second cousins and other relatives and learn more about her family history on her dad's side. She loved that trip so much. She actually moved there about a year later. We helped her with that move. And as she was going through that, through that process with her, the one thing that she kept saying is she was really impressed with herself at how tough she can really be when she had to be tough. So if you want to learn and grow, um, certainly moving abroad is a great way to do that. Understand that with the transition, it's going to be a little bit slow to make friends. There's going to be potentially some language barriers, cultural barriers in the, in the beginning. And if you want to have a successful transition or a fast transition, the best way to do that from what I've seen is adopting the culture, language, and societal norms. This will just help provide for a much smoother transition. Now, Pat, I know you've traveled a lot. You've had extended stays in various places. What are some tips or tricks that you've used like apps um, to help with that? Well, I think first and foremost, before you do something like this, get to know somebody that has done it already and go to school on them. We've got some friends that uh, moved from Southern California to Assisi, Italy, and uh, have just had done it very, very successfully and just absolutely love it there. Uh, we've got a friend that uh, was walking the Camino de Santiago uh, 20 years ago, met a Spaniard that uh, was walking it as well. They got married. Now they have a, uh, a business that um, uh, organizes um, uh, uh, tours to walk the Camino de Santiago, and they spend half of their year in Denver and half the year uh, in, uh, in Spain. Um, there's a lot of people that have done this very, very successfully, and if you can get to know them and talk to them and go to school on them, I think it'll help, uh, help tremendously. Um, Making friends abroad, uh, 
you know, the realtor that you use is probably not going to end up being your best friend because they can't be everybody's best friend. So you've got to look uh, more broadly than that. But I've found people uh, overseas to be, uh, particularly in Europe, to be just really all, all around the world, just, just be very, very friendly and welcoming uh, for the most part. And uh, I, I, another thing that you can do that's really important, I think, is you've got to spend time over there before you make a decision to move. And you can't just go over there during tour, tourist season. You've got to be there at different times of the year and for extended periods of, of, um, uh, of time. I think that's uh, very, very important. And one of the ways that you can do that is that you can go over there and you can volunteer um, there's a lot of volunteer op opportunities around the world where you can go and volunteer for a month, whether it be, you know, someplace in Africa or Europe or, um, uh, you know, any other part of the world. So that's worth looking into because it's really kind of cool to go over there and, and, and actually live and, you know, have a day-to-day -day routine and, and, and be active and engaged in the community for, uh, for a period of time that can help you make that, uh, that uh, uh, decision. There's um, some uh, schools such as Road Scholar, R-O-A-D uh, Scholar, that organizes uh, lengthy uh, tours or staycations or volunteer or language-based uh, stays there where you can spend as much as, um, uh, you know, maybe, uh, well, so maybe several months there at a very reasonable price and learn the language during that period of time and have have kind of intensive uh, instructions or, like I said, volunteer. So there's some real opportunities to go over there and in a very meaningful way, live there, participate in the daily, you know, rhythm of life there and, and, and get to know uh, a whole lot about it and get a good feel for it before you make that big decision. Thank you so much, Pat. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about relocating in retirement. Now, relocation has always been popular. Like we always think of Florida, right, as the poster child for relocation for retirees. Um, I do expect this relocation to contribute to continue in the future as more people are moving for cost of living, lifestyle, or just to be closer to their loved ones. And I especially see this with grandparents that want to be closer to their grandbabies. So maybe you're thinking about relocation. You've got to understand that there's pros and cons to both staying where you're at and potentially relocating. So let's say you live in Calif sunny California and you can afford to pay the sunshine tax and you can afford to live there. Well, why move? If you stay there, you're going to stay close to your loved ones that are there. Don't have to uproot everything. And life's going to continue as normal. You can always travel and visit them if you want to. Now, if you are seriously relocating, there can be some benefits there. Now, if you're leaving a state like California, which is one of the most expensive in the country, well, you're probably going to find lower cost of living. Along with that lower cost of living, that's going to give you more money to afford to do more things. I mean, just think of it from this perspective. You know the definition of a millionaire in California is a homeowner, right? I say that kind of tongue in cheek, but it illustrates the point here where individuals in more expensive states tend to be house rich, cash poor. So if you move to another state where maybe your house is worth 900,000 here in California, maybe you move to another state and you buy a house for 500,000. Well, then that gives you 400,000 that was in real estate that now can be used to use and do other things. And of course, when you do relocate, it's gonna make new friends and you're gonna have new adventures. You know, my father, uh, sorry, my sister-in-law and brother-in-law relocated to South Carolina about a year ago and it seems like every other weekend they're on some excursion up and down the East Coast and they're just checking out all the sites and seeing and doing things that they never would have had the chance to do otherwise. And they're having a great time doing that. So if you are serious about relocating, there are some steps that you want to take, especially if you're going to be leaving a state like California, New Jersey, New York or Connecticut. Those states are notorious for making it very difficult for people that want to leave. I myself have left California three times. I've been audited once, and I'm going to see if I'm going to be audited a second time here with my most recent move. I myself have left California. I'm now in Phoenix. So this is something I kind of have a little bit of expertise on. Um, with moving, some things that you want to do. Obviously, you want to develop a physical presence there, buy a home, have a rental property that you're using. You want to set that up. And as soon as you're there, um, set up a driver's license in the new state, change your voter re registration to the new state, make sure you get a local bank account. 
Okay. If you bank with a national bank like Wells Fargo or Chase, that's fine. You can keep it. But set up a, a meaningful account like a CD or a savings account with a local credit union or a small regional bank. You're also going to want to change things like your attorneys, your doctors, your dentists. You want to have those in the new location as well. So what you're trying to do is create a very strong argument. So if the state of California comes and says, no, you're still a resident of California, if you have all these things, it's very difficult for them to make a case against you. You know, um, I did have one client who uh, owned a condo here in, Cal in Orange County. The condo was worth about $800,000 at the time of his move. He decided to move to Vegas, but he wanted to keep the condo here in California. And he wanted to keep it because he had his daughter here, and his, which had his grandchildren. And he didn't want to spend the summers in Vegas. I mean, who can blame him on that? Well, he bought a home in, in Vegas. It was worth about 600000 where his condo was 800000 here. But that home in Vegas was 3,000 square feet compared to his 1,500 square foot condo here in Orange County. Well, what California did is they made a case against him saying that he was still a California resident because the condo, even though it was smaller, had a higher home value than his primary residence in Vegas. Told this story to another client that moved from California to Phoenix a couple of years ago. He had two homes here in California. He was planning on keeping one, if not both of them. He ended up selling both afterwards. And he did what I think is the best thing you can do, which is just completely cut ties. Um, I know a few attorneys, if this is something you're considering, have made a very good living just fighting the state of California and helping people make that transition. And when you're dealing with these states, um, they're pretty sneaky. So what they're going to do is they're going to try and track your credit card usage. And they're going to use GPS tracking on your cell phones to really tell where you're at. I know the rule is six months in a day is typically where your residency is. The rule that I like to use is what I call two times one. So for every two months you spend in your new state, you can spend one month in your old state. So over the course of a year, you should be spending no more than about three to four months in your old state in about eight to nine months in your new state. That again, just helps um, with legitimacy and makes it harder for the former state to argue a case against you. So when we look at the popular states for relocation, you know, we see a lot of things in common here. We see low cost of living and low state taxes or no state taxes. That would be the case here for like Texas, Florida and Tennessee. And it's funny because Pods uh, just did a report two or three days ago talking about the top five states that people are leaving California and where they're going. The top five were Texas, Florida, Tennessee, Oregon, and Washington. Uh, Chad, I think we have another survey. We do. So along those ends from the group, let me launch this real quick. Um, and but for again, for anybody that will be watching the replay afterwards or revisiting this, I'll read this off. Um, but what what city do you think has the lowest cost of living? So uh, here we only put four. So, you know, one of them is correct. But Boise, Charleston, Tampa Bay or Las Vegas. Um, let me leave this up on the screen for just a few more minutes while we gather responses. And then we will share results again with the group. Okay. Most responses and let me close polling real quick for the group. And I'll share it, but let me read it off again real quick. So here, uh, about 38% of the people here say Boise, 27% say in Charleston, uh, only 12% say in Tampa Bay, not a lot of Florida lovers out there. Um, and then 22 people say in Las Vegas. Let me give it back to Paul and you can share the results. Like the truth. Yeah. All right. So I myself, without knowing the answer, I would have thought Boise. Okay. So unfortunately, Boise is actually one of the more expensive states to move to. The lowest cost out of those examples, surprisingly, is Tampa Bay. Now, with Brady going there and bringing all that stuff, I would have thought it would have been more expensive myself, but that actually is one of the cheapest places to move to in terms of popular destinations that people are relocating to. And cost of living is really, really important when you're looking at making this move. So let's say you're spending $112,000 per year in LA. Well, if you want to move to Phoenix, Miami, Charlotte, Austin, 
most places in the U.S., that translates to about eighty to eighty-six thousand in fees, or sorry, in cost of living. With uh, Nashville, Vegas, and Tampa Bay actually being some of the cheapest locations that people are moving to. Paul, a, a note of caution. Um, I think uh, probably one of the worst reasons to relocate is to save taxes. <laughs> Um, and I've got quite a few people that I know that have moved out of the state to uh, save taxes. And some of them were connected with the sale of a business. And, you know, and it may make a whole lot of sense to do that. But I'm, I've am i been really surprised at how many people I know have moved to uh, Nevada or Texas or, or Nashville, for example, and have moved back uh, to California. Um, a fairly high failure rate, I would say, if I can use if I can use that word. And and I would say, you know, number one, you know, moving away from your grandkids is probably not <laughs> um, going to satisfy you unless you really hate your grandkids. <laughs> um, number two would be the weather. Um, moving someplace that has a dry climate like California to a climate that has an awful lot of humidity is um is is really difficult uh actually and um uh you know those are probably two and, and the third thing would be uh a significant change in culture you know the culture that we enjoy in southern california is different from the culture in other parts of the country some other parts of the country in particular and that's not neither good nor bad it's just different and those are probably the, the three biggest things or the biggest reasons why people end up moving back uh, to California after a few years. And it's surprising how often that happens. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you, Pat. I've seen people relocate back. Like I said, I did it myself twice. Or I've seen other individuals move to another location. Like I knew someone that moved to Florida. There was a little bit of culture shock for them. They weren't prepared for the weather either. And the hurricanes was a little scary for them. So they actually ended up moving up to Nashville. And they've been happy there. So it's not uncommon to see something like that happen. Now, when you are moving, you know, we do need to take into account state taxes and how that impacts you. When we look at the states that people are leaving the most, it's pretty easy. You just look at the state tax map and this will show you. So California and New York with a bullet have the most people leaving their state, followed closely by places like Illinois and Minnesota as well. Now, when we look at taxes at the state level, everybody wants to choose a place that has no state income tax. Makes sense, lower costs. Well, there's only nine states to choose from if that's the decision, if that's what you're, what's driving your decision. The first one is Alaska. I don't know too many people that are brave enough to move there. Texas, New Hampshire, Wyoming, South Dakota, Florida, Nevada, Tennessee, and Washington state. Now, with state taxes, right, this is their primary form of revenue. So if they're not charging you income taxes, they have to get that tax revenue another way. And so typically, they're either going to have high property taxes, which is what we see in Texas, where they have some of the highest property tax rates in the nation, or they're typically going to have a high sales tax, like we see in Washington and Tennessee. Again, some of the highest rates in the nation. It's really just South Dakota and Wyoming that have low taxes across the board. And I really think this is the case is they're just trying to get people to move there. So when we're looking at states, we want to have those with state tax benefits. You know, and Pat says something um, I think is very true, which is business owners moving out of state for tax reasons. And this is especially true in Arizona, which has uh, reduced taxes on capital gains. So if you're a business owner in California, and if you can legitimately relocate your business to Arizona, and then sell your business a few years later when it's an Arizona business, what happens is you can switch the taxes are huge savings because you're switching it from California, which taxes capital gains at ordinary income tax rates, let's say nine to 12%, where if you go to Arizona, the tax rate is less than two and a half percent. Now we're talking with retirees here. So we wanna know what states are favorable for retirement income. Think things like social security. Well, those states are going to be Colorado, Georgia, Illinois, Michigan, Mississippi, and Pennsylvania. Now, what's kind of funny here about Mississippi is while it has reduced taxes on retirement income, they need to get you another way. So they actually have one of the highest sales taxes in the nation. So it's really funny where with you look at a lot of these states, right? And there's that give and take, right? 
Texas, no state income tax, but they have the sec uh, third or fourth highest uh, property tax rate in the nation. California went the other way and they said, we're going to tax you high with income taxes and high with sales taxes. And I'm not here to bash on California guys. Like I said, if you can afford to pay the sunshine tax, it's a great place to live. Um, so let me make that very clear. This is not an anti-California webinar. <laughs> um, aside from the property taxes, the sales taxes, and the income taxes, just something to be aware of is going to be if the state you're moving to has an estate or an inheritance tax. Right now, if you're a married couple, you don't have to think about this at the federal level unless you have more than $22 million. If you're single, you don't have to think about this unless you have more money than $11 million, okay? Well, some states have much lower numbers. So let's say you're one of the people that moved from California to Washington. Again, one of the top five places people are going these days. Well, here, any estate over 2.2 million is going to be subject to estate taxes. Doesn't mean you don't move there. It just means additional planning needs to be done around this. All right, so let's go ahead and start talking about RV living. So when we look at moving abroad or relocating, those are permanent, right? You're making a decision of giving up one place to go to another place. Well, there are ways to kind of eat your cake and have it too. One of those is RV living. So we do have one client, for example, that actually does live abroad. They have a place in the Mexican Riviera that they spend several months a year. The remaining portion, they actually own an RV that they travel all throughout Central and Western US visiting friends, family, and places that they like to visit. Now, Chad, I think you actually had a pretty cool story of someone you know as well. Uh, yeah, yeah, I do actually. Former client um, that said, I mean, they're both healthy. They have been running miles like every single you know week for years, like ultra healthy group. So they said, I'd rather get an RV and their house is paid off. They actually like clean up their house and put a lot of their very, you know, very personal belongings in storage. And so a small storage cost, but then hired a property manager and rented out their, their property on Airbnb. Uh, and what's cool about that is now they have a new source of income in retirement from Airbnb. Um, rather than getting a full-time tenant, they did Airbnb on purpose, right? A little bit less income, it's less guaranteed. But if whenever they want to be back, they can be back. And they just spend all of their time traveling between like their three or four kids and all their grandkids. Um, checking out national parks. I think one of them doing like a baseball field, baseball park tour. He wants to try to visit every single baseball park in the world. Um, so it's, it's, like, it's like a cool way to spend you know their first 10 or 15 years. They have no intent of doing it forever, um, which they, so they do plan to come back to their house at some point, but they just want to spend some time having fun in the meantime. Paul, there's a, in the United States, there's 11.2 million RV owning households and half of them are 55 or older, which I thought was kind of interesting. <laughs> that is a fantastic statistic and not surprising at all. Now, if you're looking to live that RV lifestyle, you really got to choose between an RV or a trailer slash fifth wheel. Now, just to be very, very clear here, the difference between a trailer and fifth wheel is just how it hooks up to the vehicle. If it goes into the bed of the truck, like you see here in the picture, this would be a fifth wheel. If it hooks up to the bumper, that's going to be a trailer. Now with an RV, there's some distinct advantages and disadvantages over a trailer or fifth wheel. For an RV, it's gonna be uh, more easy, more comfortable to drive. When you have uh, a trailer hooked to that hitch, especially if you're in a windy area, what happens is that causes the trailer to kind of sway and it makes it a little bit harder to drive. And with the RV, you don't necessarily have that because you don't have the hitch. With the RV, it's going to be easier to travel on travel days, right? As long as it's not the person, as long as anyone can use the bathroom and everybody else can still keep driving down the road, as long as it's not the driver, right? So you don't have to have as many delays for things like that. And it doesn't require an additional vehicle. Everything's in one, you know, it's all in one, so to speak. Now, there are some disadvantages with the RV as well. They're going to be more expensive to purchase and maintain compared to a trailer, and they can be harder to drive than a trailer. When you have that hitch, you kind of have, it's easier to turn. Where with an RV, especially if you have a larger one, say 30 feet or longer, it takes a little bit of skill that you may have to learn to get comfortable driving those. Now with trailers and fifth wheels, again, there's their, they have their own advantages and disadvantages. With a trailer, 
This can allow you to keep a normal vehicle like a truck. So this is great, for example, if you want to visit national parks. You can pull in your trailer into the campsite, unhook it, and then you just drive your truck or, tr or SUV or whatever vehicle you have, you just drive that around. Now, the other nice thing too with trailers is because they don't have that vehicle attached to it, like the motorhome does, it creates more interior space. And so they actually have are more spacious typically than the RV counterparts. Now for the disadvantages with a trailer, especially if you get a longer one, you're very limited on the vehicles that you can choose. So if you want a Tesla, trailer may not be the right fit for you. With an RV, they tend to be lower than uh, the trailers are. So again, when you're in that windy area, say driving through Palm Springs, for example, the trailers are gonna start swaying more because they're gonna catch more of that wind. And then finally, if you're driving a 30 foot trailer and having a 20 foot truck, you've got a 50 foot combined length, you're not gonna fit into a lot of campsites. And this is especially true if you're going to Western or national parks in Western US, they tend to have smaller sites. So here's some tips and tricks. Number one, choose your vehicle wisely. Understand the costs of buying them and understand, <clears throat> sorry about that, um, that what you like today may change sometime in the future. I can't tell you how many clients I've had that have bought an RV and they end up selling it to get a trailer or they bought a trailer and end up selling it to get an RV. Um, so to help with that, you really, really want to do several test runs with RVs and trailers of different sizes. Uh, we helped a client last year. Um, they were both able to work remotely. And so they decided they want to live in RV full time and drive around the country. They originally were just planning on getting something like a Sprinter van or a super small RV, like 24 feet. Um, that, you know, it's just the two of them. They thought they would be totally fine. They test drove that on the first day. They decided that was way too small for them. So then they went too big. They ended up switching to a trailer, found that to be a lot more enjoyable. So they ended up buying a truck and a trailer. And that's what worked best for them. Now, on your travel days, try and follow what is called the 333 rule. You want to try and drive no more than about 300 miles a day, arrive by 3 p.m., and try and stay three days. This allows you to see areas of the country that you probably wouldn't otherwise see. And this takes a lot of the stress of those long, long days on the roads kind of off. You know, if you get to your place by three o'clock, you have plenty of time to stretch, walk, hike, just do something a little active, get that blood flowing, and be rested for the next day. Now, if you're not able to do that 333 rule and you are driving late into the night, um, Walmart and Crackle Barrel locations throughout the U.S. do allow for overnight camping for RVs or trailers. So while this isn't necessarily recommended, it is something to keep in mind if you do find yourself in an area and you're not quite sure where to go for the night. Now, if you're living the RV lifestyle, it's going to be hard to get your mail, right? Because you're not staying in one location. There are services like Escapee's RV Club that can help handle getting you your mail. We've already talked about doing this several test runs. And just understand, if you live in an RV or a trailer, it doesn't necessarily mean cheaper cost of living, right? They have their own upkeep costs to maintain. You're traveling, so you got expensive gas and insurance. And buying an RV is not cheap either. You know, those typically are going to be 10 or 15 year loans. It's almost like buying a small home. It's exactly like buying a small home, I should say. So just understand your cost of living is going to be somewhere between three to eight thousand per month, most likely. Well, one other tip is uh, I've been told that uh, um, when you're when you're an RV or you're traveling around the country, you know it really is important to take a look at your health insurance and make sure you know when, and understand what your coverage is and how it's affected uh, by seeking treatment in in uh, other states. And also, a lot of states, when you travel, it's, it's hard to get in to see a doctor. Um, it's helpful if you know people in the area that can refer you to their local practitioner or whatever. You're more likely to get an appointment uh, quickly than uh, if you don't know anybody. You're just, uh, you know, dialing for a doctor kind of a thing. So healthcare uh, issues are, are really important, particularly since, as I said, over half of the, uh, the RV owners are over 55. So let's talk about traveling and retirement. And I think Pat is the expert here. Now, uh, just some basic tips or tricks here. Um, go ahead and try and maximize your credit card benefits. 
Um, I just did this for my father-in-law recently. Like I said earlier, I live in Phoenix. My, <clears throat> oh, <clears throat> so sorry about that. Uh, my brother-in-law and sister-in-law live in North Carolina. Um, so he's on the airplane almost every other weekend, visiting either us or other family members throughout the U.S. Um, and he wasn't using a, any sort of travel card with that. So I introduced him to a travel credit card. Now he's getting benefits from that. He no longer has to wait in the long lines. He's able to get through faster when he's going through airport security. And he has access to things like lounges in the airport. So it's much easier and much more comfortable traveling for him now using the credit card. And it's going to be cheaper because of the points that he's going to be accumulating. Well, there's two apps that uh, that uh, I'll bring to everyone's attention that will help you manage those uh, travel benefits uh, uh, that you get from uh, you know your credit cards. One of them is called Award Wallet, Award Wallet, and the other is Max Rewards. And you might take a look at those to help you kind of keep track of all of that and manage that because it gets to be a full time job otherwise. Yeah, and we're giving you guys a lot of different resources. And just know at the end of the slides here there's gonna be a list of all these resources and all these links for you guys to use. Make it a little easier for everyone to track. A place to look for really cheap flights, and, and this is particularly good if you don't mind you know, sitting in main cabin uh, or riding economy, but it's called going, G-O-I-N-G.com. Mm -hmm. And um, if you sign up for that, you will get notices every day on just unbelievable airfares. Uh, and if you're flexible in where you want to travel and you want to do it cheaply, this is the place to go. And they um, also will report mistakes. It's amazing how often airlines make mistakes. And for some uh, inexplicable reason, an airfare to someplace really great is just ridiculously cheap. And if you jump on it right away, you can get the deal of a lifetime. And, and those things happen often. So uh, going.com is a site that's worth uh, signing up for and taking a look at. Absolutely. And aside from just air travel, another great way to do it is just going to be looking at a cruise. You know, a lot of our clients, when they're younger, they're doing extensive air travel, going to Europe, Australia, Africa, wherever the case is. But as they get older, traveling becomes more difficult. And so at that time, a lot of people start beginning considering a cruise. Now, I'm not telling you you have to be a senior to enjoy a cruise because they're a blast, but that can be another good way to try and travel as well. And finally, just don't forget your insurance. And this is especially true after COVID. I can't tell you how many times I've seen people pay for a trip a year in advance to go to Europe, and then something happens, they get sick, and they're not able to attend that. If you don't have insurance on that, that's just wasted money, and that's just a real shame. Now, the other type of insurance you want to consider as well is going to be some form of health insurance when you're traveling abroad. Um, Pat, I think you have a resource or two for that as well. Yeah, we use a company called Travel Insured. And uh, the thing I like about it is that we can get an annual policy. We might travel, you know, three or four times a year and uh, we can, you know, have that insurance in place, uh, you know, for every trip. And it's relatively uh, inexpensive. Now, there's a difference between uh, travel medical insurance and travel trip cancellation, you know, insurance. And so those are two completely different things. But um, um, I think up and, uh, you know, we've kind of self-insured on the trip cancellation. Um, but as you get older, you have to start really thinking about that. And uh, like I've got el elderly parents, uh, mom and dad are both in their 90s. Um, you know, if I'm, you know, if I've got a trip planned, but something happens to them, obviously I'm going to cancel the trip. And so, you know, the risks are higher as you get older or, or your, your life situation changes. So you have to decide whether you can, whether you should be self-insuring for that or getting the insurance, but the medical insurance, you definitely should not be self-insuring for, uh, it costs $125,000 to medevac somebody from, uh, outside of the United States into the United States. And that's probably not something that you're likely to have to use, but boy, if you do, you sure don't, you sure want to have insurance for it. No doubt. And it's not that expensive to buy. It really isn't. Um, uh, but, uh, the medical insurance is, I think, definitely worth having when you go international. Yeah, and for seniors, there's a lot of uh, places that offer cruise discounts and flight discounts. Again, we'll, we're going to provide this resource to you guys. Um, now, the one cool thing, too, is if you like visiting national parks, you can get a lifetime pass once you're 62 or older for $80.
and that allows you to visit any U.S. National Park for the rest of your life without any additional cost. All right, so let's talk about the last topic here, which is owning a second home in retirement. What we've seen in recent years, especially since COVID, we've seen a huge rise in demand for second homes. So blue line is the demand for primary homes. Red line is the demand for second homes. And you can see here since kind of since COVID hit, that demand has just surged. And people are looking at getting a second home now more than they have really ever. Now, there's some considerations you want to have when you're looking to buy a second home. First one is, what is the end goal for your property? Is this something that you want to buy and maintain in the family for several generations? Maybe it's a cabin up in the mountains. Maybe it's a beach home, something like that. Or is it just a second home that you have that you're going to eventually sell or turn into a rental property? Um, how much time do you plan to spend in that second home? You know, if you have that second home, that's going to impact things like your ability to travel elsewhere. Um, think about how much you should finance. After you make the purchase, you're definitely going to need to update your estate plan. And then you're going to want to consider some either an LLC or umbrella insurance for asset protection. So let's say you buy a beautiful condo in Aspen and someone slips and falls. You don't want to be on the hook for that if they decide to sue you. Now, owning a home, there's certainly some major advantages and disadvantages with that second home. I don't know about you, but when I travel after the day four or day five, I want my own bed. And when you have that second home, everything in there is yours, including that bed. And it's just a way, much more comfortable way to vacation. There can be potential tax benefits with the home, including the potential for income and capital appreciation. And with a second home, you can create an asset that can be passed down for generations to enjoy. For, we have two examples of this. I have one client, for example, that has a cabin in the mountains that his grandfather built that he inherited. And that's now been put into a trust that's going to last for several generations so that his family is able to enjoy that for several generations. Uh, we have another client that's looking to buy a beach house and do something similar. Where, again, that'll be an asset that'll be for in that in the family in the name of the trust for several, several generations. However, when you buy a home, just understand that it can be potentially way more expensive than just traveling. It's going to be more work than just choosing to travel, right? Because you have upkeep costs, you have to pay property taxes, got to maintain the property. It can potentially be a financial disaster. While we've seen that huge uptick in demand for second homes, Areas where people are buying second homes, like lake properties, beach properties, mountain properties, for example, those locations tend to be more volatile in nature. Like we said before, it's going to be kind of harder to take other vacations because you have that home, you're paying for that home, so you want to make sure that you're getting enough use out of it. And if you're not there full time, your property is vulnerable when you're not there. People do pay attention when you're there or not or when the lights are on or not. Now, Pat, I know you have extensive experience on this, so can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you a story about property being uh, vulnerable. I've got a, a friend who has a, a property in southern Spain. He's from Spain originally, and he's got a condo there. And he goes back to visit uh, his family, you know, two or three times a year and stays in the condo. Well, he was flying back there, and he was sitting next to a guy, and he says, where are you going? And they ended up, turns out they were going to the same same city. And uh, he says, where are you staying? He said, oh, he said, I rented a condo there. And um, he says, well, you know, when we get there, let's share a taxi, you know, and I'll drop you off and, and then I'll go to my place. And so they get in the taxi and the taxi driver says, what's the address? And this guy gives the address and it's this guy's property, my friend's property. And he says, wait, that's where I live. And he goes, well, I rented it for two weeks. And, uh, you know, this guy had a caretaker that oversaw the property and everything. And unbeknownst to him, uh, to the owner, he was this caretaker was renting it out. Uh because he knew when this guy was going to be there and when he wasn't. And so he thought, no harm, no foul. I'll just rent this place out when when the boss isn't uh, in town and uh, good for me for doing it. So uh, those things can happen. There's a problem in some of these countries with squatters also. Um, they know when um, you know people from another country own a property and, and they kind of get a feel for when they're going to be there and when they're not. And 
And when they're not, they'll go in there and they'll squat. And then you have a heck of a time getting them out legally. Uh, it can be a real problem. So, you know, you need a caretaker that's trustworthy, that can watch the property for you and take care of it while you're uh, not using it. Um, you'll feel if you own a second home, you'll feel like every time you do get some free time, you have to go there um, because, you know, you're spending all this money on this place. You've got to use it. And uh and I used to have a, a second home uh, in Park City, Utah, and I loved it, loved it, loved it. But, um, you know, I'd get off the plane and the first stop would always be Home Depot because every time I was there, there was, you know, two or three things needed to be fixed. And I'd have a note that uh, when I came the next time to go to Home Depot and get this, that and the other thing. And so, you know, there, you know, there are there are some issues with that. It can be very, very rewarding. But. Um, I sat down one year and, and figured out how much I was spending on a second home in Park City, Utah, and realized that I could go anywhere in the world that I want to anytime I wanted to for a whole lot less money. And so that's what I did. <laughs> Thanks so much, Pat. No, it's not, right. not, I'm not, and I'm not saying that, that that does not mean that that's not the right decision for a lot of people. It is the right decision for a lot of people, but uh, but you just have to go in it with eyes open. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, with, you know, apps like Airbnbs um, these days, um, it has changed kind of some people's viewpoints on owning a second home. Like earlier, I told you guys a story of the client that sold uh, the two properties in California and moved to Phoenix, but wanted to buy a property in California two or three years later. Well, we are two or three years later, and he's decided it's much easier to just use an Airbnb for two or three months at a time than own a second property and have all the carrying costs. So, in his example, he actually chose to not get the second home, but I can point you also to plenty of clients that did make the purchase on the second home and they're very excited that they did and it's worked out well for them. Well, we thank you guys for your patience um, that gets through uh, the slide deck. Um, as we promised, there are resources here that we can provide you guys that have all the links for uh, living abroad, relocating, RV living, traveling, all that sort of stuff here. Um, one thing I did forget to mention within the uh, presentation, if you are looking at comparing different places to live and you want to look at things like cost of living, political affiliations, um, hospital, crime, all that sort of stuff, when you're looking at different places to relocate to, niche.com and areavibes.com are excellent resources to use to help kind of make those sort of comparisons. Now, please keep in mind, um, we are not paid by any of these people. Um, these are just simply some resources that we want to point you towards that can be helpful in your decision, but by no means are we saying this is the end all be all or fully just, you know, I guess that's my disclosure for the day. With that, Chad, I will let you take over. Awesome. Thank you so much. And again, as a reminder to the group, I did just post another set of links into the chat box for all of you. Um, especially for those of you that might be looking for some of those resources he just shared. Um, the first link is a link to our normal one to two minute survey. Let us know your thoughts on the content and any future content you'd like to see. Um, that's how we come up with ideas like this, right? We're not, it's not all internal brain trust. It's hearing feedback from all of you on things that you think would be valuable that we can you know, figure out and create content for. Uh, the second one link in that chat box, though, is a link to the PDF of today's slides. So if you did want all of those couple pages of resources that Paul just put on the screen, I'm downloading the slide deck, the slide deck PDF and scrolling to the back. You'll have all of the links to those. We will also have those out in our post webinar email blast tomorrow morning. Uh, now, let me kind of get to the questions. I know we're close to the top of the hour, so I know some people might need to drop at the top of the hour. So we put those. We do build these things for 90 minutes because we know we always have a lot of great questions at the end of the, the content. Um, so again, as a reminder to all the attendees to make sure we do get through them, because we do have a hard stop at the bottom of the next hour today, if you do stay on, um, there is a thumbs up. So if there's questions that you really want to see and make sure we get to as more questions continue to come in, um, please do hit the thumbs up button. I have these sorted by most upvotes to make sure I address all the most popular questions first. Um, so there, Paul, let me jump in to the very first question, the very top. It's actually the first question that came in and already has an upvote, which is cool to see. Um, but how much do you think ballpark math? And I did have Henry run some stuff for me in the background to kind of aid this. Um, do you think you would need to save if you want to retire and say, I'm going to do 20 years because I know the answer is already going to be a lot. Um, and be able to retire noting that you only have around $20,000 in retirement savings today. Wait, 
how much do you need to save if you're trying to retire in 20 years? In about 20 years, if you are starting with only 20,000. Okay. Um, there's a great chart that we can provide to kind of help provide as a general guideline here. Um, I, Not to be rude or anything like that, I just don't like answering this sort of question because the other variable is how much are you spending? If you live in rural Nebraska, your cost of living is going to be much lower than somebody living in downtown LA. So that's the other side of the equation that really has to be factored in. So if you give me what your annual spend is, I can give you an idea based on that, how much you really need to save. So let me let, let me put just some numbers up, up there so you kind of get an idea for it. Because again, like, retiring in California versus Nevada, Texas, Florida, right, all come into that. So knowing how much you're going to need in retirement tells us how much. But if you wanted to get about a million dollars, if you were to save $1,000 per month after all of your spending um, for 20 years at 6% returns on average, that would be only 462,000, right? So at 6% returns, which are call it on the in the middle of kind of what people think over the next 10 to 20 years, you would actually need to save close to $2,000 per month, right? To get to the same place to 1.1 million, if you save $1,500 a month and make 10%, you would get to about 1.1 million. Um, so 10% though on the high end of what I think a lot of people think you might make in a balanced portfolio over the next 10 or 20 years. So um, just when you think about how much do you need is the most important question. And I wanted to give those ballpark numbers. I think a lot of people say I could live on a million dollars. And if that is the case, then that's what you need to save to get there. And just keep in mind, a million dollars is gonna produce about 40,000 a year in income comfortably. Okay, next question we hear is, um, how does having a living trust affect taxes in different states? Excellent question. Um, so living a tr living trust is not going to change the taxes in a different state. However, if you do move states, you do need to update your trust to that state's laws. Each state has different state rules, like we talked about with Washington State. And if you move there, you need to update the trust to reflect those states' rules and laws. So it doesn't change anything from a tax perspective, unless we're talking like estate taxes or getting assets out of the estate. Uh, so next question I have for you, I think this is just somebody that was uh, listening in and just wanted to put some numbers behind what you're saying. You're living in Texas. Uh, I think you see the same thing in Phoenix in the, the summertime too, or Las Vegas, but some of these states that a lot of people move to for low taxes, they tend to be those that are very humid and hot too. So I think somebody out here just commenting to point out is, yeah, you might move and save money on taxes, but you might spend 500 bucks plus on your air conditioning <laughs> um, and when it gets hot over the summer. Oh, for um, sure. Next one I have here is, do you guys have any insights for credit cards that offer free airport lounges? I do a little bit, Chad. Um, American Express, of course, is uh, uh, you know a good place to start if you're really interested in the airline lounges. And then each of the airlines have their own credit cards um, that, and they have different categories of them. But um, you know, to get the access that you probably want in an airline lounge, you're probably going to spend you know five hundred ninety-five dollars a year or something like that on the credit card. You know, to get that access. So um, I I had you know, a couple of different cards that uh, uh, would, that I was paying, you know, 500 plus dollars a year for and realized that I hardly ever, ever, never yeah. used the airline lounges or, or, or most of the other benefits that they offered. And so I reduced those cards down to like a hundred dollar or $99 a year um, uh, plan. Um, I travel quite a bit and we just don't use the airline lounges. We just, I don't know, I just have never gotten the habit of doing it and never felt the need. And usually my connections aren't that, that big and it's just not worth it to me personally. But, uh, but yeah, the, each of the airlines will have a card that'll get you uh, airline lounge access and, 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 and certainly American Express as well. Yeah. I mean, what I see the most often is going to be either the City Advantage one for those that are flying on American, United Explorer. Um, otherwise, it's the uh, Platinum American is the most common one I'm seeing that are offering offering lounge access. But I think uh, the Capital One Venture and the Chase Sapphire Reserve also have some good benefits as well. Mm -hmm. But like uh, Pat said, you only need one of them because all these cars are going to have annual fees ranging from $400 to $600. Mm -hmm.
Okay, so um, the next question I have for you is, um, so I'm retiring May 2024, not 65. Concerned about leaving the 401k active through this calendar year for a number of reasons. Um, any thoughts or input about putting it into a high yield you know, account or maybe moving it to a Roth? Okay. Um, question will probably be best answered um, offline if you want to reach out to us because we can kind of dig into your personal situation and give you a more personalized recommendation. Um, right now, if you're looking at doing a Roth, uh, if you're doing like a Roth conversion, uh, might want to wait until after you retire for tax reasons in terms of how to invest it. Um, if you're approaching retirement, you probably should do an updated, do a financial plan to help figure out what your needs are in retirement. And that can help drive the allocation recommendation. Um, Sounds like they have some concerns about market volatility. And if that's, if that's the case, then they could simply go in and they could, um, you know, reallocate their uh, their existing 401k in order to reduce the potential volatility if they're if they're if that's what they're concerned about as they get close to retirement. Okay, so the next one I have is you talked a lot about RVs. I think this is just somebody having fun with us, but they say the van life is pretty cool too. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can set it up accordingly, absolutely, absolutely. Sorry. I guess um, <laughs> had a oh, client, no. yeah, had a client with a Sprinter van. Um, travel the country and they were quite happy in it and had a great time. Mm -hmm. um, so the next one I have um, is, do you know, like instead of RVs, it's actually two questions on a row on tiny homes. Um, instead of RVs, like, do you, have you had any clients look at tiny homes in retirement? Um, I actually do, by the way. Uh, and the other one is, do we know any tiny home communities oriented towards seniors? Oh, interesting question. Okay, so um, unfortunately, I don't know of any tiny home communities oriented towards seniors. I'm sure they're out there and we could probably do some research to find that, but I don't know of any offhand. Yeah, I haven't heard of any either. Yeah. Um, you know, instead of RVs, having clients looked at tiny homes. Um, well, if you're looking for lower cost of living, you might be looking to live in an RV or maybe a smaller home. Um, I have had clients um, look at what are called ADUs. Mm -hmm. um, which can be put onto it, which is a second unit on a property, which is a small home, essentially. Um, I've also had a client that is uh, buying some property and they're going to be building an ADU, or sorry, not an ADU, but building a small home on that. Um, and that's going to be their second home. Um, so I certainly do know of to people that have done that. If you're going to do that, though, you need to buy the land. If you're going to buy the land, um, then you have to look at other things like waste management, paving roads, so there are some additional costs that go into that as well, potentially. And Paul, just explain what an ADU, what what what, are the, what does the acronym, acronym stand for? Uh, accessory dwelling unit. So yeah, it's uh, really weird. You know, for, <laughs> it is, it is, you know, and like a personal, you know, I, I have a family member um, that is, um, instead of moving in with another relative, um, they built an ADU because they, they have a large property, almost a quarter acre, uh, certainly not here in California. And they they built an ADU, a small house essentially on the property for that relative to live in because the relative just didn't have, kind of ran out of money just due to some health issues. So um, I have, yeah. So definitely I've seen that. You know, one of the questions was how many cards should you have? And I would say when you travel internationally, the most important thing is um, don't just take an American Express because it's not accepted in as many places. You need you, you, it doesn't hurt to have an American Express, and particularly for things like uh, um, you know if you're renting a car overseas or something like that. There's some added benefits if you do it through American Express as far as insurance is concerned and that type of thing. But uh, you definitely need a yeah. I'd say definitely have a a, a, a Visa card with you uh, for sure because they're accepted just about any place. Um, so I would, I, usually I'll take an American Express and a, and a Visa or a MasterCard with me when I'm, when I'm traveling. Yep. Thanks for answering that. I actually had asked them, um, to ask them about that, how many cards you should have back to them because I didn't even understand what they were asking. And it sounds like Pat got it right there. Yeah. yeah. And the other thing too, uh, currency wise is you don't need traveler's checks or anything like that anymore. Um, it's just so easy to go to an ATM overseas and, 
to um, um, you know get cash out in the local currency on your debit card. Just make sure it, you have a debit card that's got a you know a four digit numeric you know pin. Uh, and you'll be just fine over there. And also the other thing is when you're traveling abroad, you're always going to get the question when you buy something, do you want it converted to dollars or do you want to get it in the local currency? Always buy it in the local currency, always charge in the local currency, because that's where you're going to get the very best exchange rate. Um, you're going to get it through your bank. And uh, that's going to be the cheapest exchange rate if you, if you, um, you know, if you have it converted into dollars over there, when you charge it there, you're going to, you're going to pay another, you know, there's just another player, you know, in the middle that's going to charge you a fee for doing that. Just because it's a follow-up on the exact same question is just in general, how much credit do you think you need just in your experience? I and mean, Pat, you've done a lot of traveling and for very extended times too. I mean, how much credit do you think you need on each one? Oh gosh. I, I think I would uh, say, one to two cards is really all you need. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of how much credit, um, that one's kind of a tricky question, but the simple answer, short answer is as much as they can give you and as long as you're not using it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the thing <laughs> on credit cards is uh, it doesn't hurt to have a lot of credit on them and it doesn't hurt to periodically just call them up and say, I'd like to increase my credit rate. Um, yeah. your, your FICO score um, partly is based on um, what percentage of your credit limit you use and you get dinged if you're using say 80 percent of it every month and uh, and your FICO score will go up if you're only using 20 percent of it every month and so it pays to have a, a high credit limit uh, on each of your cards even if you don't you know use anywhere near it um, you know each month but that'll improve your credit rating. So the next one I have is I recently read an article about people living on cruise ships. I mean, like how does how does that work? Because I think what this person's getting to. Chad, we had a client that um, it took something like 240 cruises, and uh, he was always on a cruise ship. He didn't live on them, but he pretty much did live on them because he was always on a cruise, and that was just his way of life. And they treated him like a king. It, he felt like he owned the place. He got the very best service. He met a ton of people that were kind of, you know, doing the same thing. Hey, I didn't I see you on such and such a cruise? Yeah, that was me, you know, kind of a thing. And just developed his own little community of friends as a result of doing that. And uh, some people can do it. Um, those that's those are pretty small rooms to live in <laughs> for an extended period of time. So, so they have... Rooms. Some people there just actually, love it. There actually is a ship by storylines that you can look up. There's another one coming online too. Mm -hmm. Um, and I mean you can get these cabins for anywhere from call it plus or minus nine hundred thousand to around eight to ten million, depending how big you want it to be. Oh. Um, but I think one of the like, I mean, I had a couple like friends talking about it, but I mean they work in tech, they're hundred percent remote workforce, and as long as they have an inter internet connection, they can do their job, and the cruise ship provides that for them. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's actually condos and apartments that you can buy and just have out for a whole year or longer. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's all inclusive, all your food, all your drink, and you just get to travel the world. So yeah. it'd be yeah. hard for me not to have like land to stand on at home every now and then, but yeah, it'd be fun. Yeah. Um, the next question I have here is, uh, do you have any types of just advice for like a younger folk still climbing the salary ladder um, on what types of retirement accounts they should be like saving in? Uh, you want your Roth 401k through your employer or Roth 403b through your, through your employer is going to be hands down the best way to save because there's no income limitation. So as you cl climb that salary schedule and start making more money, certain uh, retirement accounts like IRAs can phase out. If you're young, you want the Roth account over traditional because the Roth is tax-free growth. And, I, and just, I mean, simply ask yourself, would you rather have a million dollars taxable or tax-free in retirement? The answer is tax free. You want to choose the Roth account. Um, so the next one I have here is typically just in your experience talking to clients and retirees is what's the general feedback from those who chose to retire in states like Arizona, right? Phoenix, Tucson, Sedona. Do they like it in the desert climate as people over 55? How are state taxes, salary tax, cost of living? Um, and then if the last part of that is, uh, is it nice enough for those clients you know who have relocated as a Californian. And if I don't move to Portugal, Tampa, or Charleston, then Arizona is where my family unit is. So 
Um, they refuse Texas. Uh, I tell you, we've this, got we've this got is someone that I need to talk to because I lived in uh, Texas and quickly moved back. That was my shortest stint. I've actually lived in Phoenix twice, so I will be happy to answer this question. But Pat, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say that you know we've had a lot of experience with this, and I'd say you know generally speaking, um, you know the the heat in uh, uh, Arizona is a much bigger deal to Californians than it is to people in Arizona. Uh, they seem to just, you know, uh, live in it and deal with it and don't complain about it. Um, but people in California can't imagine how they do that. Uh, and I'd say the same thing is true in Arizona or in uh, Nevada to a certain extent. The, the clients that we have that have moved to Nevada, uh, to Las Vegas, uh, just enjoy it immensely. And uh, the people that we have that have moved to Arizona, I'd say just enjoy it immensely. I know people... Um, the people that I know that are that are moving back are people that have moved to Texas, people that have moved to Tennessee. And I think a lot of that is just, um, you know, it's certainly a different cultures uh, there. And maybe it's because they're further away from family and friends. I'm not real sure. But uh, those are kind of two of the areas where we seem to have people that go there for a few years and then come back. But we don't see that so much. Uh, with people that move to, uh, say, Las Vegas or move to uh, Arizona. Uh, we've got clients that have moved to Idaho and just really enjoy it up there an awful lot. Um, probably one of the most underrated places in the country is Utah, which is just a really, really beautiful state. And the access to recreation and everything is just unparalleled. Um, you can fly into Salt Lake City and be on about 10 different uh, ski resorts within, you know, 30 minutes. Um, and, and they have great weather there for the most part, but, uh, but we don't see a lot of people moving there uh, at all. Uh, although or, they have an, they have an incredible internet technology uh, economy uh, that they built up there. But um, for that, Arizona, that's my two cents on it. Sorry, Pat, I didn't mean to cut you off there. Um, for Arizona, this is what I'd say. If you're looking to leave California, um, you're, you're no longer going to pay the sunshine tax, so you don't get the sun year round. You don't get the perfect weather. So you have to choose, essentially pick your poison, right? It's either going to be the heat in Arizona or Nevada. It's going to be humidity in the south. It's going to be the snowy winters in the north. So you kind of choose where you got to go. I chose Phoenix because it's close to family. I still have family here, but I have a lot of family that moved to Phoenix. And my family that moved to Phoenix were all over older than 55. They've absolutely loved it. Um, you know, outside of Florida, Arizona does have the largest uh, senior community in the U.S. So if you are someone that's retiring, it's very easy to find other people in your similar demographic, age range and everything else um, there. Now, the one downside you got to keep in account is it's the desert. So we already know it's hot. You know, um, you just got to kind of adjust for that. Um, the other part that you have to take into consideration a lot of people forget about is it's a desert, so it's dusty. So if you have asthma or mm -hmm. breathing issues, mm -hmm. if you're going to move to Phoenix or Tucson, that is something that you should take into account is the potential respiratory challenges of breathing in that sort of dirt. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if you're going more north, like Sedona, Flagstaff, um, you're not going to have the same issues there. Um, Prescott beautiful areas um and they're going to have different weather because if you go up to the flagstaff for example you're going to get snow you're not going to get the extreme heat you're going to get the opposite you're going to get the cold and the snow so i'm happy to reach out to us happy to answer that more offline my brother and his wife they live uh, probably about two-thirds of the year in uh in, in scottsdale and, and the other third in utah uh, northern utah they, they kind of got the best of both worlds nice Okay, so I got two more questions in the queue right now, unless more come in. Um, but the next one is I have two other 401k accounts other than my current employers. Um, those ones don't seem to be climbing. Uh, should I combine them and go with my current and go from there? Yeah. Unless you give kind of the it depends, but I can share some insights here too. Uh, yeah, it. I'll let you go because I'm the it depends guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's a, you definitely have to kind of look at the differences in, in the 401k plans. Uh, yeah, I think if you're on this line, there's a fair chance that your 401k is with BFSG. We help oversee it. Um, yeah, so I have confidence in the team working on that uh, plan that the investment options are really good and the fees are very competitive. Um, but and in all cases, it really depends where the last employer was. You know, were they a bigger employer? Maybe they have an even cheaper 401k because 401ks you know get less expensive as the organization grows. 
Uh, or was it a smaller employer? Maybe it's higher fees, right? And what are the investment options available? And what are you trying to do? What are the different accounts available? And I think really our team of financial planners likes to look at all that before they can really kind of point you in the right direction. Yeah, I mean, the only other thing I would say is I would look at the allocation. Like if one of them is vested 100% bonds, the other one's 100% stocks, we're going to expect very different return profiles. So I would start first at making sure that they're invested in similarly and kind of work from there. We had one yeah, question that... Uh... One question, uh, somebody asked us to refer a financial planner to him. I would refer Paul Horn and his team <laughs> to, uh, to somebody that was looking for a financial planner. Uh, that's that's a big part of what we do in our business. And so I would highly recommend Paul and his team. Uh, the, the next one, I, or at least the follow-up to that last question we had is um, that they're with Fidelity and One America. Um, so for this individual, I'd say definitely reach out. Um, Fidelity One America might be where the plans are and where the assets are held, but the my point was how big the employer was, um, because the employer is the one that would be, you know, that there's that depends how much Fidelity or One America is charging, right, the plan to be there. Um, so again, I definitely would reach out and we can kind of talk through that and point you in the right direction. Um, the next one I have here is uh, I'm a high earner in California. Traditional, I have a traditional 401k with a pretty large balance. Um, well, I'd like to convert to a Roth or IRA, my tax bracket has held me back. I plan to retire in a few years. We'll have a drop in my income. Um, is it worth converting after retirement or just best to stay with the traditional? Um, here, you're probably going to want to look at waiting until retirement. If your income is going to drop from, say, the 32 or 37% bracket to like the 22 or 24 that's a huge swing. And if you live in California, your taxes at the state level are probably going to also drop another two to 4% potentially. So waiting to make the conversions until retirement makes a lot of sense, especially if you're going to retire, say 65, which is the average age of retirement. Um, and then doing the Roth conversions up until you have to start the RMDs, which is around 73, 74 for most individuals nowadays. Okay, the next one, this is the last question, unless one more does come in. Um, oh, well, there's another one. It says, uh, they're kind of related though. So um, I'm 61, retiring in four years. Should I add to my Roth or continue the tax savings in the 401k? Uh, and the next one's kind of similar. Should I convert to Roth with my 401k now? Because I think the answer will be very similar for both of those. For the first one, retiring in four years, that answer completely depends on your tax situation and your income. If you're a high income earner, say you're in the 24 bracket or above, um, and you're going to retire in four years and your income is going to drop because you have no other income sources, probably makes sense to defer it until you retire and then do the conversions. Um, otherwise, maybe you have a pension. And so when the pension kicks in, when you retire, maybe your tax bracket is going to stay close to the same. If that's the case, might as well do the Roth and get the tax-free growth instead. So again, it's all dependent. And I hate to say it depends as a financial planner, but every answer is really dependent on each person's individual situation, tax situation, goals, that sort of thing. Yep. And uh, somebody said, I think I missed the question to the living or the answer to the living trust question. Oh, Got that it. Was so the question about does it affect your taxes in the states? And we said no. Yeah, that, yeah, that's it. Okay, I've got just a couple of things I want to say as we close up here. Um, you know, kind of interesting. Can you, you know, answer that though, real quick, Paul? Can you answer oh, re-answer that question? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so for the living trust, um, the living trust doesn't actually impact taxes while you're living. Um, where it would have a tax impact was if it was an irrevocable trust, which is different from a living trust. But if you're going to move from one state to another, you do need to update the living trust to the new state's rules because every state's rules are different regarding trusts. Okay. Um, just a, a couple of things I wanted to kind of say just in, as we wrap up here. The, um, the best vacation, international vacation I ever had uh, was the cheapest. And that was walking the Camino de Santiago um, de Compostela in Spain. We walked 500 miles from uh, the last village in France uh, up and over the Pyrenees and all the way across northern Spain from one side to the other. And 
Uh, we had such a wonderful experience and met so many wonderful, wonderful people from all over the world. And, you know, by far and away, probably the cheapest vacation I ever took. And it was 34 days, uh, you know, of walking about 15 miles a day. Uh, another thing is this, uh, this group called Road Scholar uh, puts together overseas language learning uh, excursions, if you will. And you can, you know, go to a place like Sevilla, Spain, or Florence, Italy, or any number of different places. And um, they have all different lengths, but you can go for as much as 45 days, for example, to um, a place like Sevilla or Florence for about, oh, eight or nine thousand uh, dollars. And um, it's, it's intensive language. You're living in the community, experiencing the rhythm of the life there and everything and kind of a fun way to learn a language and really figure out if it's some place that you really want to, you know, maybe move to at some point. So uh, not a bad way to go. And the volunteer uh, vacations can be very fulfilling. Also, I've got a close friend that spent a month in uh, um, uh, a village in Africa uh, as a volunteer kind of a missionary volunteer last summer and just kind of had a kind of a life-changing experience. I've got a friend right now that's in Calcutta, India, uh, volunteering for two weeks in the home for the dying that uh, was founded by Mother Teresa and is still operated by her missionaries and charities. So there's just a whole lot of different ways you can tackle this and, and, uh, uh, and look at it. And I would encourage you to, uh, you know, really, you know, look at it eyes wide open and just see how many wonderful, wonderful ways you can figure out how to experience and, and uh, you know, embrace this wonderful world that we live in. Um, I see a couple questions here on um, Roth conversions versus 401k. Uh, reach out to us individually. We're happy to um, talk more about your individual situation, try and help answer that question for you. Yeah, that's it. That's I'm actually sending a note with our uh, in content information. So you can see it on the screen here too. Uh, for this one, I will put um, just my direct email address as well. You can always reach out to me, chat at bfsg.com um, with any questions you have on that financial planning email is a great spot because it goes to kind of a pool of all of our financial planners. So it doesn't matter if, you know, Paul might be busy with a client, you know, later today, somebody else is there to answer and, you know, Keith Johnson, Henry, um, our, you know, team here in Irvine in our financial planning office. So one last question came through real quick, Chad. Is there a fee yep. to speak with us? You guys, we're, we're here as a free resource for you guys. That's why we do these webinars. So reach out to us. We're happy to have an initial conversation. We're not going to charge you a fee or anything like that. Thank you, everyone. I hope everyone has a great afternoon. Paul, can you put that disclosure up here real quick so oh, um, compliance doesn't kill us? <laughs> thank you, sir. And thank you, Pat, for your time today as well. My uh, pleasure. And we hope everyone has a great afternoon. Thank you, guys. Okay.